So our first guest is Dr. Stanton Glantz. He is a UCSF professor of medicine, conducts research on a wide range of issues, including the health impacts of smoking on smokers, and really importantly for all the policies, secondhand smoke, the impact of secondhand smoke on people who don't smoke who are around them. He also looked at the efficacy of smoke-free policies to improve health, which again was extremely useful for those of us doing uh, policy. And he's also tracked um, how the tobacco industry fights tobacco control programs. He's written numerous publications, including the groundbreaking reviews of tobacco industry documents from Brown and Williamson, which show that the tobacco industry knew nicotine was addictive and that smoking caused cancer 60 years ago, that they knew that 60 years ago. So, and my favorite thing that you uncovered was some kind of internal memo that referred to people like me in every county. They said, it's like being pecked to death by a bunch of ducks. So that was my favorite job title, one of those ducks. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Glantz. So, well, thank you for having me. Um, and looking at these uh, flyers, it's giving me nostalgia. Um, uh, uh, we, in 1983, I got, I got involved in this issue in 1978. Uh, when we had a state initiative called Proposition 5 to create no smoking areas, which would mean that the smokers had to sit on that side of the room and the non-smokers were on this side of the room. And that would destroy America, ruin freedom, destroy the economy, blah, 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 blah. And the tobacco companies, I mean, it shows where we've come in. They rolled in. We started out ahead three to one. They spent six and a half million dollars, which at that point was more money than was spent in every other statewide election put together and beat us. Now they've spent seven and a half, the soda people in San Francisco. And then in 1980, we tried again and were beaten again. And then we went to doing local ordinances. And when San Francisco passed its local ordinance restricting smoking, which wasn't even that strong for the time, but it got covered as if it was. And then the industry came in and did something they'd never done before. They actually forced a referendum on, on the law. Uh, it was the first time there'd been a referendum in 83 years or so in San Francisco. And, and we, we actually used this flyer right here, and we won. So that's very encouraging. So um, the interesting thing, um, uh, and I was talking to somebody out in the hall, and, and they were saying, like, people are beginning to get turned off by all of the campaigning against the soda taxes, just the saturation advertising, and all the mailers. And, I mean, who knows what will happen, but in... In, um, in the 1978 campaign, we started out way ahead. The tobacco people pushed us down. We, we took our paltry little few hundred thousand dollars and managed to get on television for the last little bit of the campaign and recovered a bit, although not enough to win. But Mervyn Field, who started the field poll, which is a very well-regarded um, uh, polling organization, the California poll, actually wrote an op-ed after the election that said if the tobacco companies had spent more money, they might have lost because their tracking was actually starting to predict the backlash. So, you know, let's hope that's true for you guys, too. So, so this is actually, these are some slides I put together for a diabetes meeting, and I thought about, well, Maybe I should change it to say controlling something else, but diabetes was just as good. And I think that the key lessons to me, and you're going to hear a bunch of details from the other speakers, so I decided they had more slides than I did. But, you know, the, there, there are several important lessons from the tobacco wars. And the first one is that policy solutions are a lot more effective than trying preaching at people to change their individual behavior. And when you're talking about food, it, it's just as true as when you're talking about tobacco, because it's actually, if you want to eat in a sensible way, 
it's actually hard because the food supply for most people, if you just eat what's out there, it's bad. And it, you know, if you if you live in San Francisco or Berkeley and you're reasonably well off, you can eat carrots and you know, uh, uh, you know stuff like that. But there's part, you know, a lot of America. Like I was in South uh, Western uh, Indiana a few months ago, and they had like nothing but junk food. It's like it turns out it was like the fattest county in the country. And you just could not find any place to eat except there was like the really junky junk food and then there was the less junky junk food. And that is in fact the reality for most people. And so doing things to intervene at a policy level, creating clean indoor air laws, raising taxes on, on cigarettes, uh, the kind of things that are being discussed in the soda tax, uh, I think you know are the only thing that's going to solve the problem in the end because what it's going to do is change the boundary conditions, change the markets in which these big corporations have to act in a way which is going to force their profit maximizing behavior to lead to different outcomes. And, and, it's, and, and, and the whole goal in my view of these things is to change the environment to make it easier or possible for people to make the good decisions. Just preaching to them that you should eat differently or behave differently just isn't enough. And that leads you to soda taxes, menu labeling. And I think you're still going to talk about the how the bad guys outsmarted the good guys on menu labeling, right, Mark? OK. And, and things like fat restrictions. Um, and, and the opposition that you guys are seeing is exactly the same opposition that we've run into on Tobacco Forever. One is to hear about freedom. Okay, who's against freedom? <laughs> oh, you're all lying. You're all against freedom. That it's all just a matter of personal responsibility. You know, if you don't want to eat crappy food, then don't. Um, the claim that the science underlying the policy process is junk and in fact, it was the cigarette companies who invented the term junk science. Uh, the nanny state, how many of you are nannies? <laughs> Tell the truth, you're all nannies if you're here, except for the couple people sent by the soda people to spy on us. And you know, that it's just the government telling you what to do. And then a general anti-tax mentality. And so, you know, that is exactly the same as we've been dealing with. And what happened, oops, just, I hate it when these, the computer like takes control. I'm gonna back up one so it doesn't get ahead of me. The, the, um, so what ended up happening back in 1978 and 1980 was we ran these two state initiatives to try to have non-smoking sections. We got beat both times but the interesting thing that came out of the two campaigns was like one of the kind of principles of running a no campaign on an initiative and I, or a ballot measure. And, I, you know, it's exactly what people were telling me about outside is you can't really criticize the solution or the problem, or pardon me, you can't deny the problem so you criticize the details of the solution. So back in 1978, the cigarette companies could not run an ad campaign that said, protect your right to breathe secondhand smoke, vote no on five. So their campaign was, yes, nobody lies, secondhand smoke is bad, but Proposition 5 just isn't the answer. And they criticized the details of the proposal. And if you want, I can get into wow, what they criticized and, and all of that. Well, I'll tell you. So one of the things, the two guys who wrote the initiative, Peter Hanauer, who lives here in Berkeley, and Paul Loveday, were both lawyers, figured, you know, back in the, in, the, in the 60s and the 70s, they weren't enforcing the pot laws at rock concerts. And so they thought good, good public policy would not be to pass another unenforceable law or unenforced law. So they included an exemption to the smoking restrictions for rock concerts. And so 
the, the other side had this great radio ad that would come on with this kind of nondescript music, kind of light rock or whatever it is. And then this, this voice, this gravelly voice would come out and say, you're under arrest for smoking. And then the other person would say, I can smoke here, it's a rock concert. And then the other guy, you remember this? Says, oh, it's a jazz concert. And then they, <laughs> and then it was a great end. And then they spent like 20 seconds arguing about whether it was a rock concert or a jazz concert. And then they just said, this is ridiculous. Proposition 5 just isn't the answer. And the thing is, I think it, it, that, that campaign at, r that they ran against this actually laid the foundation for all the subsequent victories in California because it really did put the whole secondhand smoke issue on the public agenda. And in 1980, when Paul and Peter decided to try again, you know, I, I and came to me to help, I actually figured we would lose again because the, the stakes for the cigarette companies were just so high. We had done, or I, working with a couple colleagues, had done an analysis where we estimated that smoking restrictions would reduce cigarette consumption by as much as 5%, and that's a lot of money, and we figured they would spend what it took to beat us. Well, turns out we were wrong. Now that we actually have a lot of smoking restrictions, creating a smoke-free workplace reduces smoking by about 30%. So the tobacco companies are really, you know, they're highly motivated to stop these things. And so what we realized after we lost the second time, uh, again, a state initiative, was we didn't have enough money to run a state campaign. It takes a lot of money to run a state campaign. But we knew the public was on our side, very much the situation that you have on the, on the soda issue. And so we said, OK. <coughs> We know the public is with us. Where can we win at a local level? By bringing the magnitude of the fight down to something manageable. And we, we looked around the state. We took the, 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 the financial corporate entity we'd created to run the campaigns and renamed it Californians for Non-Smokers' Rights, later Americans for Non-Smokers' Rights, which is still based here in the People's Republic of Berkeley. Back then we were above the old UC theater in like one room office, two room office. And, the, um, and we looked around and we said, where is there a community that isn't too big, because we didn't have a lot of money, but where there's an intelligent politician who wants a social leadership and a few crazy people who want to get a law through creating non-smoking areas which then was the big radical thing, and it was Ukiah, okay? How many people know where Ukiah is? Well, that's more than most, and, and we got it. It took a whole year, but we passed the law in Ukiah. Actually, there had been one in Berkeley before that. If you go around Berkeley and in the restaurants, you see these old, faded, we have a non-smoking section signs that are still in some of the restaurant windows. That was from before my time. But, but what we found is that this idea of grassroots mobilization worked because the tobacco people would send in their lawyers and their out-of-town guys. And when you're talking about a local city council, at least in the, you know, particularly in these smaller places, they didn't you know, they didn't give a shit if some lobbyist came in from out of town. And my favorite memory from that time was when Sausalito was considering an ordinance, and I, <clears throat> they dragged me over there to testify for it. And the tobacco company sent down a lobbyist named Clay Jackson. Remember Clay Jackson, Mark? He was this big, huge guy, I mean, like, really tall, fat, big, represented tobacco, oil, real estate, you know, pharma, you, you just, you know, you name it, all the rich, bad industries. And I was in Sacramento where this guy would come in to a, a Senate hearing and all the senators would like sit up straight and like, yes, sir, Mr. Jackson, sir, what do you need for your contributions? He was called the 51st senator. And he showed up, he ultimately went to jail for a bribery, which was quite excellent. But he showed up at this meeting in Sausalito, 
And, you know, when you test, how many of you have testified at a local public hearing? Very much. You know, what do you do? The first thing you say, my name's Stan Glantz and I'm from San Francisco. Well, he got up and said, my name's Clay Jackson and I'm from Sacramento. And one of the city council members say, well, what are you doing here? You know, and, right, right? And, like, do you own property here? Do you have a business here? Do you have family here? Do you, like, vacation here? No, 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 no. Well, what the hell are you doing here? And they paid absolutely no attention to him. So this was a really, really, really big problem for the tobacco companies because on one side, they had all their money and lobbyists and PR firms and stuff that works pretty well at the national and state level and in the bigger cities, but they did not have a genuine grassroots component. And these people sitting around kitchen tables with a little help from us were beating them. And so what the tobacco companies did was the first one was R.J. Reynolds. Oops, ah, this thing is getting ahead of me. And R.J. Reynolds hired a public relations firm called Walt Klein and Associates, and they created a smokers' rights group, which was a, a group of presumably local people who would show up at these city council hearings and say, oh, we're just a group of local concerned citizens and we're opposing these ordinances. And it didn't really work very well for them because the kind of people who, I mean, most smokers wish they didn't smoke. Most smokers in any given year try to quit smoking. Most of them don't like the cigarette companies. And so the kind of people they got working in these groups were pretty much yahoos. And they would get up and threaten. I mean, I was at city council hearings where they called the city council members communists back when it was like out to be a communist, except in Berkeley. And, and you know, and threaten their kids and tell them they were against America and blah, 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 they're against freedom. And this generally pissed off the city councils who then just voted for the, for the laws. And that wasn't working too well for them. Well, then... Uh, Philip Morris came along, the biggest of the cigarette companies and the most politically sophisticated, working with Brown and Williamson and Lorillard, and they hired Burson Marsteller, which at the time was the largest public relations firm in the world. And Burson Marsteller created something called the National Smokers Alliance, run by a guy named Tom Humber, who had been a vice president at Burson Marsteller. And the difference between the National Smokers Alliance and these earlier groups is this was a much more professionalized operation. It was centrally run. It was run by um, public relations people. And then they, you know, had the locals kind of show up for window dressing, but they were in charge. Well, then <clears throat> the Koch brothers, anybody here the Koch brothers? <laughs> They found, oh, I'm getting, this thing is like stealing my uh, surprises. They created something called Citizens for a Sound Economy, which is, I'm just, I hate this computer. Um, I'm a PC kind of guy. Um, the, the, uh, and Citizens for a Sound Economy was uh, set up as a central group in Washington and a think tank to promote right-wing ideas and anti-regulatory environment and the cigarette companies realized that, hey, we have a lot in common with these guys and started funneling money into Citizens for a Sound Economy, which opposed tobacco taxes, opposed smoking restrictions, opposed Clinton care and all of that. And you can see that Beverly McClintock and uh, Michelle um, Matola went from Philip Morris to work for CSE. And, 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 and then the next step was Citizens for a Sound Economy split about five or six years ago into two or, or, or morphed, ugh, this is, I hate this, morphed into two organizations called Freedom Works and Americans for Prosperity, which is the Tea Party. And if you look at the, um, at the various little arrows in the family tree, and this is not the entire family tree, you can see that a whole bunch of the guys who had worked for Walt Klein and Associates and the RJR Smokers' Rights Group ended up working uh, for a DCI Group and FLS Connect, which provided the PR support for citizens for, sound or for Americans for Prosperity. 
and uh, and and uh, this woman Nancy Plowton, uh, well, I don't need to go through all the names, and then to fight the secondhand smoke issue, Philip Morris, which was losing on the science, created something called the Sound Science Coalition, which again invented junk science. Humber went down there. Some other guys, Tom Borelli, who used to be at Philip Morris, and they created these other organizations, including the Center for uh, in Individual Freedom, uh, the National Center for Public Policy Research, and the Center for Consumer Freedom. The Center for Consumer Freedom was originally called the Guest Choice Network, which was set up to fight clean indoor air laws. And you know, if you uh, and and so. You know, we published this a couple years ago, um, basically saying that the Tea Party was not something that appeared out of nowhere in 2009 in reaction to Obamacare, but in fact dates back to the 80s and the cigarette companies. This led to a very negative reaction by the Republicans and actually got the head of NIH beaten up at a House appropriations hearing. And uh, we were subsequently invest, as was NIH who funded this. Invest there was a special investigation of all of us, and we didn't do anything wrong, uh, at least to our point of view. Well, what does this have to do with sugar? Well, back when Mayor Bloomberg, um, uh, uh, you know, tried to do his sugar tax, this was a full-page ad that was run uh, in um, in the New York Times and elsewhere from the Center for Consumer Freedom. And so if you look at the PR firms and the, the, the so-called grassroots organizations that are working against these soda taxes, the whole infrastructure that's fighting them, it grew out of, it's just the same thing repurposed. And it's not even repurposed, because it's still out there fighting tobacco. They just added to their client list. So um, if you want to read more about that, this is the paper that we, we published, the quarterback from behind the scenes. And that's a quote from the early 90s when Philip Morris is describing how they're going to create what is now called the Tea Party, that they're going to quarterback from behind the scenes. They're going to develop a central policy think tank that promotes these very right-wing values, anti-tax, anti-regulatory, and then they're going to create a grassroots network that will work in tandem with them. And that's exactly, you know, what they're dealing with now. And we had a tobacco tax on the ballot here in California a couple of years ago, Prop 29, and Americans for Prosperity was out there fronting for the tobacco companies again. So this is, I paid the exorbitant amount of money to unlock this article. You should all go read it. And you should look not only at this, but there's a huge appendix online that lists all of the people and all of the organizations. And I am sure if you look through that, you'll recognize some of your friends. So that's my spiel. <laughs>